The Thirteenth Candle, written by T. Lobsang Rampa, narrated by Michael Sharp. Explanation The Thirteenth Candle, well, it is meant to be a logical title derived from what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to light a candle, which is far better than cursing the darkness. This is my thirteenth book, which I hope will be my thirteenth candle. You may think it is a very little candle, perhaps one of those birthday cake candles, but I've never had a cake of any kind with candles, never even a birthday cake. And now, with my restricted, sugar-free, low-residue diet of not more than a thousand calories, it is too late to bother. So, indulge me. Let's pretend that this is the thirteenth candle, even though it be as small as a candle on a doll's birthday cake. Chapter 1 Mrs. Martha McGoohoogly strode purposefully to her kitchen door, a tattered scrap of newspaper clutched in a ham-like hand. Outside, in the parched patch of weed-covered ground which served as a back garden, she stopped and glared around like a cross-ball in the mating season, awaiting the advent of rivals. Satisfied or disappointed that there were no rivals for attention in the offing, she hurried to the broken-down fence to find the garden limits. Gratefully propping her more than ample bosom on a worm-eaten post, she shut her eyes and opened her mouth. "'Hey, Maud!' she roared across the adjoining gardens, her voice echoing and reverberating from the nearby factory wall. "'Hey, Maud! Where are you?' Closing her mouth and opening her eyes, she stood awaiting the results. From the direction of the next house but one came the sound of a plate dropping and smashing, and then the kitchen door of that house opened and a small, scraggy woman came hopping out, agitatedly wiping her hands on her ragged apron. Well, she growled dourly, what do you want? Hey, Maud, have you seen this? yelled back Martha, as she waved the tattered piece of newsprint over her head. How do I know if I seen it, if I haven't seen it first? snorted Maud. I might have done, then. On the other hand, I might not. What is it, anyhow? Another sex scandal? Mrs. Martha McGoohoogly fumbled in the pocket of her apron, and withdrew large horn-rimmed spectacles lavishly besprinkled with small stones. Carefully she wiped the glasses on the bottom of her skirt before putting them on and patting her hair in place over her ears. Then, noisily wiping her nose on the back of her sleeve, she yelled out, "'It's from the Dominion. My nephew sent it to me.' "'Dominion? What shop is that? Have they got a sale on?' called Maud with the first show of interest." Martha snorted in rage and disgust. No, she shouted in exasperation. Don't you know nothing? Dominion, you know, Canada. Dominion of Canada. My nephew sent it to me. Wait a moment. I'll be right over. Hoisting her bosom off the fence and tucking her glasses into her apron pocket, she sped down the rough garden and into the lane at the bottom, more sighed with resignation, and slowly went to meet her. "'Look at this!' yelled Martha, as they met in the lane at the garden gate of the empty lot between their two houses. "'Look at the rot they write now. Soul? They ain't no such thing. When you're dead, you're dead, just like that. Poof!' Her face flushed. She brandished the paper under poor Moore's long, thin nose, and said angrily, "'How they get away with it, I don't never know. You die, it's like blowing out a candle, and with nothing after.' My poor husband, God rest his soul, always said before he died that it would be such a relief to know that he wouldn't meet his past associates again. She sniffed to herself at the mere thought. Mordo Haggis looked down the sides of her nose and waited patiently for a crony to run down. At last she seized the opportunity and asked, But what is this article which has so upset you? Speechlessly, Martha Mahu Googly passed over the tattered fragment of paper that was causing all the commotion. "'No, dear,' she suddenly said, having found her voice again. "'That's the wrong side you are reading.' Moore turned over the paper and started all over again, her lips silently forming the words as she read them. "'Well!' she exclaimed. "'Well, I never!' Martha smiled with triumphant satisfaction. "'Well?' she said. "'It's a rum-do, eh, when such stuff can get into print. "'What do you make of it?' Moore turned over the page a few times, started to read the wrong side again, and then said, "'Oh, I know!' Helen Hensbaum will tell us she knows all about these things. She reads books. Oh, I can't bear that woman, retorted Martha. Say, do you know what she said to me the other day? She said, May beets grow in your bed.
belly. God forbid, Mrs. Magoohoogly. That's what she said to me. Can you imagine it? The cheek of the woman. Fah! But she got the gen. She knows her stuff about these things. And if we want to get to the bottom of this, she violently fluttered the poor unfortunate sheet of paper. We shall have to play her game and butter her up. Come on, let's go see her. Martha pointed down the lane and said, There she is, hang out her smalls. Fancy hussy she is, I must say. Get a load of them new pantyhose. Must be on a special somewhere. Me, good old-fashioned knickers is good enough for me. She raised her skirt to show. Keeps you warmer when there's no man about, eh? She laughed coarsely, and the two women sauntered down the lane towards Helen Hensbaum and her washing. Just as they were about to turn into the Hensbaum garden, the sound of a slamming door halted them. From the adjacent garden, a pair of the hottest hot pants appeared. Fascinated, the two women stared. Slowly, their gaze travelled upwards to take in the see-through blouse and vapid painted face. Struth, muttered Mordo Haggis. There's life in the old town yet. Silently, they stood and goggled as the young girl in the hot pants teetered by on heels as high as her morals were low. "'Makes you feel old, like, don't it?' said Martha Magoohoogly. Without another word, they turned into the Hensbaum place to find Mrs. Hensbaum watching the girl going on the beat. "'Top of the morning to you, Mrs. Hensbaum,' called Martha. "'I see other sights at the end of your lane, eh?' She gave a throaty chuckle. Helen Hensbaum scowled even more ferociously as she looked down the lane. "'Ah, her!' she exclaimed, dead in her mother's womb she should be already. She sighed and stretched up to her high clothesline, demonstrating that she did wear pantyhose. "'Mrs. Hensbaum,' began Maud, "'we know as how you are well-read and know all about such things, so we have come to you for advice.' She stopped, and Helen Hensbaum smiled as she said, "'Well, now, ladies, come in, and I will make a cup of tea for you this cold morning. It'll do us all good to rest a while.' She turned and led the way into her well-kept home, which had the local name of Little Germany, because it was so neat and tidy. The kettle was boiling, the tea was steaming. Mrs. Hensbaum passed round sweet biscuits, and then said, "'Now, what can I do for you?' Maud gestured to Martha, and said, "'She has got a queer sort of tale from Canada, or some such outlandish place. Don't know what to make of it myself. She'll tell you.' Martha sat up straighter and said, "'Here, look at this. I got it sent from my nephew, got himself in trouble over a married woman he did, and he scarped off to a place called Montreal in the Dominion. Write stuff sometimes, just sent this in this letter. Don't believe in such stuff.' She passed over the tattered scrap of paper, now much the worse for rough handling. Mrs. Helen Hensbaum gingerly took the remnant and spread it out on a clean sheet of paper. "'Ah, so!' she yelped in her excitement, quite forgetting her normally excellent English. "'It's good, no?' "'Will you read it out to us, clear-like, and tell us what you think?' asked Maud. So Mrs. Hensbaum cleared her throat, sipped her tea, and started. "'From the Morning Star, I see Monday, May 31st, 1971. "'Hmm, interesting, yes. I to that city have been.' A short pause, and she read out. "'Saw himself.' leave his body. Heart victim describes dying feeling. Canadian Press, Toronto. A Toronto man who suffered a heart attack last year says he saw himself leave his body and had strange, tranquil sensations during a critical period when his heart stopped. B. Leslie Sharp, 68, says during the period his heart was not beating, he was able to observe himself face to face. Mr. Sharp describes his experience of the current issue of the Canadian Medical Association Journal in part of a report by Dr. R. L. Macmillan and Dr. K. W. G. Brown, co-directors of the Coronary Care Unit of Toronto General Hospital. In the report, the doctor said this could be the concept of the soul leaving the body. Mr. Sharp was taken to hospital after his family doctor diagnosed a pain in his left arm as a heart attack. The following morning, Mr. Sharp says, he remembers glancing at his watch while lying in bed, hooked to the wires of a cardiograph machine and intravenous tubes. Just then, I gave a very, very deep sigh, and my head flopped over to the right. I thought, why did my head flop over? I didn't move it. It must be going to sleep. Then, 
I'm looking at my own body from the waist up, face to face as though from a mirror in which I appear to be in the lower left corner. Almost immediately I saw myself leaving my body, coming out through my head and shoulders. I did not see my lower limbs. The body leaving me was not exactly in vapour form, yet it seemed to expand very slightly once it was clear of me, said Mr. Sharp. Suddenly I'm sitting on a very small object, travelling at great speed out and up into a dull blue-grey sky at a forty-five degree angle. Down below me to my left I saw a pure white cloud-like substance, also moving up on that line that would intersect my course. It was perfectly rectangular in shape, but full of holes like a sponge. My next sensation was of floating in a bright pale yellow light, a very delightful feeling. I continued to float, enjoying the most beautiful, tranquil sensation. Then there were sledgehammer blows to my left side. They created no actual pain, but jarred me so much that I had difficulty in retaining my balance. I began to count them, and when I got to six I said aloud, "'What the are you doing to me?' and opened my eyes. He said he recognised doctors and nurses around his bed, who told him he had suffered a cardiac arrest and that he had been defibrillated, shocked by electric pulses to start his heart beating normally. The doctors said it was unusual for a heart attack patient to remember events surrounding the attack, and that usually there was a period of amnesia for several hours before and after an attack. Well, exclaimed Helen Hensbaum as she concluded her reading and sat back to gaze at the two women before her. How very interesting, she reiterated. Martha McGoohoogly smirked with self-satisfied pleasure that she had shown the foreign woman something she had not known before. Good, eh? she smiled. The real original McCoy of bunk, eh? Helen Hensbaum smiled in a quizzical sort of way as she asked, "'So, you think this is strange? No, you think it is the... what you call it? The bunk? No, ladies, this is ordinary. Look, here, I show.' She jumped to her feet and led the way into another room. There, in a very smart bookcase, reposed books, more books than Martha had ever seen in the house before. Helen Hensbaum moved forward and picked out certain books. Look, she exclaimed, rifling the pages as one handling old and beloved friends. Look, here is all this and more in print. The truth. The truth brought to us by one man who had been penalised and persecuted for telling the truth, and now, just because some silly pressman writes an article, people can believe it is true. Mrs. Martha McGoohoogly looked curiously at the titles. The Third Eye, The Doctor from Lassa, Where's that? she muttered before scanning the rest of the titles. Then, turning round, she exclaimed, You don't believe that stuff, do you? Cor, flip me blooming eyelids. That's fiction. Helen Hensbaum laughed out loud. Fiction, she gasped at last. Fiction? I have studied these books, and I know they are true. Since reading You Forever, I too can astral travel. Martha looked blank. Poor doll is mixing German with her English, she thought. Astral travel? What's that? A new airline or something? Maud just stood there with her mouth hanging open. All this was much beyond her. All she wanted to read was a Sunday supplement with all the latest sex crimes. This astral, astral travel, or whatever it is, whatever it is, asked Martha, is there really anything in it? Could my old man, who is dead and gone, God rest his soul, come to me and tell me where he stashed his money before he croaked? Yes, I tell you, yes, it could be done if there was a real reason for it. If it were for the good of others, yes. Heapers, jeepers, cats and creepers, ejaculated a flustered Martha. Now I shall be afraid to sleep tonight in case my old man comes back to haunt me and gets up to his old capers again. She shook her head sadly as she muttered. He always was a great one in the bedroom. Helen Hensbaum poured out more tea. Martha McGoohoogly fingered the books. Say, Mrs. H, would you... "'Lend me one of these?' she asked. Helen Hensbaum smiled. "'No,' she replied. "'I never lend my book because an author has to live on the pitiful sum which is called a royalty. Seven percent it is, I believe. "'If I lend books, then I am depriving an author of his living.' She lapsed into silent thought and then exclaimed. "'I'll tell you what,' she offered. 
I will buy you a set as a gift. Then you can read the truth for yourself. Fair enough. Martha shook her head dubiously. Well, I don't know, she said. I just don't know. I don't like the thought that when we have put away a body all tidy-like and screwed him down in his box and then shoveled him in the earth that he is going to come back all spooky-like and scare the living daylights out of us. Maud felt rather out of things. She thought it was time for her to put in her two bits worth. Yes, she said hesitantly, when we send him up the crematorium chimney in a cloud of greasy smoke, well, that should be the end of that. But look, interrupted Martha, with a cross glance at Maud, if, as you say, there is life after death, why is there no proof? They are gone. That is the last we hear of them. Gone. If they did live on, they would get in touch with us. God forbid. Mrs. Hensbaum sat silently for a moment, then rose and moved to a small writing desk. Look, she said, as she returned with a photograph in her hands. Look at this. This is a photograph of my twin brother. He is a prisoner of the Russians, held in Siberia. We know he is alive because the Swiss Red Cross have told us so. Yet we cannot get a message from him. I am his twin, and I know he is alive. Martha sat and stared at the photograph, and turned the frame over and over in her hands. My mother is in Germany, East Germany. She too is alive, but we cannot communicate. Yet these two people are still on this earth, still with us. And supposing you have a friend in, say, Australia, whom you desire to telephone, even if you have his number, you still have to take account of the difference in time. You have to use some mechanical and electrical contrivances, and even then you may not be able to speak to your friend. He may be at work, he may be at play, and this is just the other side of the world. Think of the differences of phoning on the other side of this life. Martha started to laugh. Oh dear, oh dear, Mrs. Hensbaum, you are a card, she chortled. A telephone, she says, to the other side of life. Hey, wait a minute, though, suddenly exclaimed Maud in high excitement. Yes, sure, you have something there. My son is in electronics with the BBC, and he was telling us, you know how boys talk, about some old geezer who did invent such a telephone, and it worked. Micro frequencies or something it was, and then it was all hushed up. The church got in the act, I guess. Mrs. Hensbaum smiled her approval to Maud and added, Yes, it is perfectly true. This author I have been telling you about knows a lot about the matter. The device is stopped for lack of money to develop it, I believe. But anyhow, messages do come through. There is no death. Well, you prove it, exclaimed Martha rudely. I can't prove it to you just like that, mildly replied Mrs. Hensbaum. But look at it like this. Take a block of ice and let it represent the body. The ice melts, which is the body decay, and then we have water, which is the soul leaving. Nonsense, exclaimed Martha. We can see the water, but show me the soul. You interrupted me, Mrs. Magoo Hoogley, responded Mrs. Hensbaum. The water will evaporate into invisible vapour, and that represents the stage of life after death. Maud had been fretting because the conversation was leaving her behind. After several moments of hesitation, she said, I suppose, Mrs. Hensbaum, if we want to get in touch with the dear departed, we go to a seance who then put us in touch with the spirits? Oh dear, no, laughed Martha, jealously guarding her position. If you want spirits, you go to the pub and get a drop of scotch. Old Mrs. Knickerwacker is supposed to be a good medium, and she does, like the other kind of spirits, too. Have you ever been to a seance, Mrs. Hensbaum? Helen Hensbaum shook her head sadly. No, ladies, she replied. I do not go to seances. I do not believe in them. Many of those who do go are sincere believers, but, oh, they are so greatly misled. She looked at the clock and jumped her feet in agitated alarm. Mein lieber Gott, she exclaimed, the lunch of my husband I should be getting already. Recovering her composure, she continued more calmly. If you are interested, come along here at three this afternoon, and we will talk some more. But now to my husband's duties I must attend. Martha and Maud rose to their feet and made for the door. Yes, said Martha, speaking for both of them, and asked, We will come again at three, as you suggest. Together they walked down the back garden and out into the back lane. Only once did Martha speak when they were parting. Well, I don't know, she remarked. I really... 
dunno, but let's meet here at ten to three. See ya! And she turned into a door while Maud walked further up the lane to her own abode. In the Hensbaum house, Mrs. H swept around in a fury of controlled Germanic efficiency, muttering strange words to herself, dishes and cutlery spewing from her hands to find their unerring places on the table as if she were a highly paid juggler at a Berlin music hall. By the time the front gate clicked and the measured tread of her husband's footsteps reached the door, all was ready. Lunch was served. The sun had passed its high and was angling down to the western sky when Maud emerged from her door and sauntered jauntily down towards her friend's house. A stunning apparition she was in a flowered pink dress which smacked strongly of a bargain store near whopping steps. Yoo-hoo, Martha, she called as she reached the garden door. Martha opened the door and blinked dazedly at Maud. Blimey, she said in an awed voice. Scrambled eggs and sunset, eh? Maud bristled. "'Your skirt's too high, Martha,' she said. "'You show the lines of your girdle and your knickers. Who are you to talk anyhow?' And, of a truth, Martha did look a bit of a sight. Her two-piece pearl-grey skirt and jacket were almost indecently tight. A student of anatomy would have no difficulty in locating the various landmarks, even including the linear alba. Her high heels were so high that she had to strut, and the quite unnatural height gave her a tendency to tail-wag or behind-bounce. With her considerable endowments in the dairy bar department, she had to adopt a remarkable posture like an American soldier on parade. Together they paraded up the lane and entered the Hensbound back garden. Mrs. Hensbound opened the door at the first knock and ushered them in. "'My, Mrs. Hensbaum,' said Maud, in some surprise as they entered the parlour, "'have you gone into the book-selling business?' "'Oh, no, Mrs. O'Haggis,' smiled the German woman. "'I thought you were very interested in the psychic sciences, "'so I bought a set of these ramper books for each of you as a gift from me.' "'Gee!' muttered Martha, fingering one of the books. "'Strange-looking old fellow, isn't he? "'Does he really have a cat growing out of his head like this?' Mrs. Hensbaum laughed outright, her face purpling in the process. "'Ach, no!' she exclaimed. "'Publishers take great liberties with the covers of books. "'The author has no say at all in the matter. "'Wait, I show you.' And she dashed away up the stairs to return somewhat breathless, carrying a small photograph. "'This is what the author looks like. "'I wrote to him, and he replied and sent me this, which I treasure.' "'But Mrs. Hensbaum,' said Martha in some exasperation, as they sat discussing things, "'Mrs. Hensbaum, you have no proof of anything. It is all fiction.' "'Mrs. McGoohoogley,' replied Mrs. Hensbaum, "'you are quite wrong. There is proof, but proof which has to be experienced, to be lived. My brother is in the hands of the Russians. I told a friend of mine, Mrs. Rhoda Carr, that he had visited me in the astral, and told me that he was at a prison named Dnepropetrovsk. He said it was a very large prison complex in Siberia. I never heard of it. Miss Rodokar said nothing then, but some weeks later she wrote to me and confirmed it. She is connected with some sort of organization, and she was in a position to make inquiries through undercover friends in Russia. But, very interestingly, she told me that many people have been able to tell her such things about their relatives in Russia, and all, she said, by occult means. Maud was sitting with her mouth open. Then she sat up straight and said, My mother told me that once she went to a sales and she was told some very true things. Everything she was told came true. But why do you say that these seances are no good, Mrs. Hensbaum? No, I did not say that all of them were no good. I said I did not believe in them. On the other side of death there are mischievous entities who can read one's thoughts and who play games with people. They read the thoughts and then give messages, pretending that it is from some Indian guide or from some dear departed. Most of the messages are silly and meaningless, but sometimes by accident something comes through which is fairly accurate. They must blush a bit when they read my thoughts, sniggered Martha. I never was a Sunday school girl. Mrs. Hensbaum smiled and continued, "'People are very misled about those who have passed over. There they have work to do. They are not hanging around waiting, panting to answer silly questions. They have their work to do. 
Would you, Mrs. O'Haggis, welcome some silly telephone call when you were extremely busy at best of the time? Would you, Mrs. McGoohoogly, welcome a nuisance at the door when you were already late for bingo? Oh, she is right, you know, muttered Martha. But you said about Indian guys. I've heard about them. Why do they have to be Indian? Mrs. McGoohoogly, pay no attention to such tales, answered Mrs. Hensbaum. People imagine Indian guides, imagine Tibetan guides, etc., etc., etc. Just think of it. Here, in this life, one may regard the Indian, the Tibetan, or the Chinese as poor, underprivileged, coloured natives, not worthy of a second thought. How, then, can we suddenly regard them as psychic geniuses as soon as they get to the other side? No. Many most uninformed people adopt an Indian guide because it is more mysterious. Actually, one's only guide is one's over-self. Ah, tis beyond us you're talking, Mrs. Hensbaum. You have lost us amid the words. Mrs. Hensbaum laughed and replied, It is so. The books you should read first may be starting with the third eye, and, if I may be so bold, may we come and talk to you again? asked Maud O'Haggis. Yes, indeed you may, for it will be my pleasure replied Mrs. Hensbaum hospitably. Why do we not arrange to meet here at this time one week from today? And so, a few minutes later, the two ladies were ambling along the lane again, each carrying a load of books which were the gifts of Mrs. Helen Hensbaum. I wish you'd said a bit more about what happens when we die, though, said Maud wistfully. Oh, you're no soon off by the look of you, responded Martha. The lights burned long at the McGoohoogly and O'Haggis's residence. Deep into the night, a glimmer of light shone through the red blind of Martha's bedroom. At times, a vagrant wind would edge aside the heavy green drapes of Maud's sitting room to reveal her hunched up in a high chair, a book clasped tightly in her hands. A late bus roared past, carrying nighttime office cleaners back to their homes. In the distance, a train clanked majestically by, the heavy load of freight cars swaying and rattling over the rails of a shunting yard. There came the wail of a siren, police or ambulance, neither mattered to more, deeply immersed in her book. From the town hall clock came the chimes and the hour strike indicating that the morning was progressing. At last, the light faded from Martha's bedroom. Soon, too, the downstairs light was extinguished from Maud's sitting room, and, for a few brief moments, a glimmer of brightness appeared in her bedroom. The clatter of the early morning milkman disturbed the peaceful scene. Soon there came the street cleaners with their trundling carts and metallic clangour. Buses swung into the street for early morning workers to board and be carried yawning to their jobs. Smoke appeared from a myriad of chimneys. Doors opened briefly and slammed hurriedly as people sped forth in the daily race with time and trains. At last... The red blind of Martha's bedroom shot up with such violence that the poor tassel was set a dancing. The startled, sleep bleared face of Martha stared blankly upon an uncaring world. Her hair, set in tight curlers, gave her a wild, unkempt appearance, while a vast flannel nightdress accentuated her large size and more than ample endowments. Later, at the O'Haggis house, the door slowly opened and an arm stretched out to reach the milk bottle on the step. After a long interval, the door opened again, and Maud appeared clad in a striped housecoat. Tiredly, she shook two mats, yawned violently, and withdrew again into the seclusion of her home. A solitary cat emerged from some dark passage, peered cautiously around before venturing to walk sedately to the roadway. Right in the centre of the street, he stopped, sat down, and it is toilet, face, ears, paws, and tail, before ambling off into some other dark corner in search of breakfast.